Hello, and welcome to Arts and Entertainment. With Chris and Randall. I'm Chris. I'm Randall. And welcome to the show. Uh, today we're going to be talking about art installations and immersive art experiences. But before we get any further into the show, as always, we like to ask people, please like, subscribe, share, comment. We want to get a conversation going, especially uh, we want to hear what you think how we're doing. And if you have any suggestions about how we can do anything better, or if there's a topic in the world of arts and entertainment you'd like us to cover, Randall, what's a good way to reach us? Well, check out our website first, chrisandrandall.com, because there's various ways to uh, connect with us. Um, and you can check out our Facebook page, Arts and Entertainment with Chris and Randall. Awesome. We really want to hear what you have to say. Okay, well, today I guess we're going to be talking about um, this new trend of uh, pop-up stores. Have you, have you, uh, have you uh, been to one of these, Chris? No, I have not. You've never been to a pop-up? Oh, I've been to pop-up stores. Okay. And I have seen these uh, immersive art pop-up. Yeah, there's immersive art. They call it sometimes. I mean, there's different names for it, but um... they're hard to get. Uh, like tickets to like I know like right now there's a Van Gogh I believe yeah uh, sometimes museums do them so sometimes a museum yeah. will do like a pop-up they'll sometimes they'll call it a pop-up I mean so it really I mean I think it really goes back to uh, something called an installation or installation art um, and you know what that is I mean it's like you take like what is that well Installation art started, I guess, um, I mean, I'm looking at Wikipedia. I mean, it might have started in uh, the 1960s. I mean, probably in the 70s. Some people so like with the American abstractionist movement where they would uh, take they would basically almost like stage scenes. Yeah. I mean, sometimes they 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 credit Duchamp with it for his uh, like ready maids or kind of like that. But yeah, but imagine imagine you take a room and then you decorate it to to make like a scene of a movie or you just like like I'll tell you uh there was one god I can't remember the name of the artist now but one that was uh uh very that became not, like notorious to travel the world uh in museums is this fine artist she made an installation um I can't remember what it was called but basically it was like her bedroom it was like this 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 bed and these sheets are all crumpled and like used condoms and it was like it looked like i know you're talking about beer remember. bottles yeah and it looked I, like I, i've seen her and her and, her, and the other contemporaries of that she worked with installation it, i i think what they were trying to do at this point was to try to show that art didn't just have to be in two dimensions or in sculptural dimensions that you could really create this kind of three-dimensional living space right so the effect it had was and i went to see this exhibit is you walk into the room and you're supposed to feel like you're in her bedroom and yeah. it's a mess and you can see like what, what she's been up to <laughs> the night before and you know there's trash and empty beer bottles everywhere and um i remember people i think it was online i was reading some forum and people were were saying that uh uh, they left trash in there, you know, because they thought it'd be funny. And I mean, <laughs> and nobody would know <laughs> because the place you know, was And sometimes was there are mess. installations where there's actual people as part of the installation. Yeah, sometimes I've there's performers. Those, there's performers, mm -hmm. you know, or a person sleeping on a bed. In, in the Marcel know. Duchamp episode, we talked about a few installations he did. Uh, yeah. His last piece, Duchamp's last piece, um, it's really more of a diorama. You're looking through like uh, a peephole, but it, it does have uh, the kind of psychological effect of installation because it does feel real. Um, uh, so anyway, museums have been doing these things for years. Um, and some installations have been more abstract. Okay. They don't always seem like a scene out of a movie or something or, or a play. You Sometimes know? you walk into a room full of video monitors, just showing young men on skateboards and gorillas in a zoo. Mm -hmm. and yeah, something like that. Against each other. I've seen that. I mean, I, it's very weird. I've only seen the really, S, like Nam June Park video installations with TVs that look like they're broken, that keep on repeating an image or soundscapes that are, you, that are really a room where there's nothing to look at, but there's all these various sounds. Right, the, ins from different 
Right, yeah. There have been sound installations where you just basically yeah. walk into an empty room almost. Maybe there's a few pieces and they're visual pieces, but then all, you're hearing sound. There's hundreds of speakers and you're just hearing all these sounds from different directions. Uh, so there's been stuff like that. I mean, there's been stuff with laser lights and video and um, string and, you know, all sorts of things. Uh, you know, and if you look up installation art online, you'll get some you'll get some feel for it. But, you know, the, the problem about looking it up is uh, uh, it's not very well documented. You know, it's hard to document an installation. And because it's really something, I guess, you have to be there. You have to I experience mean, it, right. I mean, yeah. this you it's know, like, like fine art, you know, like paintings and sculptures. You can take a really nice photograph, put it in a in an art history book, or put it in a frame, and you like okay, maybe seeing the Mona Lisa in real life is a very <laughs> big experience. But I could also show you a pretty good photo reproduction of the Mona Lisa, or even like of the sculpture of David, and you'll you'll get it, even if you don't see it, right? Yeah, and a lot of sculptures even they're meant to be seen more from like a one angle. You know, yeah. like, like, why would you, you can look at the David from the back, but you know, it's better looking at him from the yeah, front. No one's know. ever looked at it. Like, okay. He's got an interesting ass, <laughs> you know, he is. Let's like always talk about his ass. Uh, but you know, but that's the thing. I mean, you're right. But there is no point of focus in an installation. You kind of have to be there. And then once you're there, you can't just passively stare. You have to kind of figure out what you're, you know, it's almost like being in a maze. You know? Right. Well, some installations have had a point of focus, like there's right. maybe a statue in the middle you're supposed to focus on, but then the whole room is decorated, you know, to support some kind of atmosphere for that statue. Yeah. I mean, but it, but how do you document that? How do you describe it? You know, I mean, I guess you could do like a 360 degree video or something, but um, it's not really well done, you know, online. I mean, uh, usually when I see installations documented, you know, there's like a, a photograph here or there and then somebody tries to describe it and then... If I've seen it, if I've actually seen it in person, I read the description or look at the photos, I realize that wow, this wasn't very well documented. Actually, <laughs> this is not and, like and a really good. If you talk about it, it sounds like you were on a drug trip. Yeah. Well, what was it about? Well, like there's a basketball, and then there's a woman singing Aida, and then you have to touch the head of a monkey, and then the whole room is full of old sneakers. <laughs> you know, like like it sounds stupid. You know, and it can be quite brilliant, but you'll never be. I mean, it, in some senses, I guess kind of what's cool about when they were coming up with installations was, you know, how do we create something that can't be replicated by a textbook? Well, what, what kind of art can we make that no photograph or camera could ever do justice to? Right. And I want to say sometime in the 90s, maybe fine art museums, maybe later than that, fine art museums started getting interested in having installations. Like, I think if you go to a museum today, you can you can a lot of times find an installation. Artists will always do an installation now because I think the museums think that that gets people in, you know, because you can look at photographs of, of a lot of the artwork online, you know. And well, you have bragging rights, right? Like, oh. I saw them create this insane thing with sand and glass and mm -hmm. old beer cans. And well, like, you got to have the experience, right? right. I mean, it's, it's, and, and, you know, I think that's something, I mean, just this is like an aside now, but I think that's something that um, when people describe installations, they tr tend to leave out, you know, be, uh, how you feel, how the audience is supposed to feel, you know, because, um, uh, I remember there was a description the the artists were talking about. I'm, I'm going to have to link to this work now, but uh, the artist where you go into her bedroom, um, I remember one critic described it as uh, you feel like you're violating her personal space, like you're walking into, you know, uh, the deepest recesses of her life, you know, and experience her di you're almost walking into her diary. And that was a great description of that piece, you know. Um, but yeah, an installation is a good one i think it's supposed to make you feel something you know you, you, you because it's immersive right it's the can immersive I, can experience I something very terrible that i've done at a few installations oh here it comes you know you know what you're about to say though i just want to say before you say it is like you know the urge to like screw with an installation a, a lot of people have it you know oh, no, I've, I didn't I've heard screw. many stories I, I wish i had no well, go ahead go ahead like i would just take a photo of myself by some cool part of the installation and then like post it on social media as if somehow this crazy installation environment was just like <laughs> the background for a really cool selfie. Yeah, well, you know, what you're talking about is like, 
I think uh, the next thing we're going to get to in today's talk is about uh, pop-ups, you know? So there's this thing going on right now where um, where people, pop-ups are like temporary uh, storefronts, okay? And I over the years, over the, especially the last like five years, I've seen pop-ups like grow in popularity. I've gone to, to many because my girlfriend has a friend that loves these, so we go to these. Um, we even went to one during COVID uh, where you just drive through really? it. Oh, I've heard about that. What is what was that about? What was the uh, experience design? Tell me about that. Because I'm really fascinated by the drive-through pop-up. I live in Southern California, so New Yorkers. I'm sorry, that's how we do it. <laughs> Tell me, what is this? What was the? Experience? I think it was. Let me think. It was at. It was in. Um, COVID had started. All the retail was closed down. So one of the shopping malls did a drive-through pop-up where they decorated their parking structure. <laughs> So, yeah. so you just drive through the parking structure. You had to buy tickets and everything, wow. uh, but you but you could take pictures, of course. See, so this is the whole thing about the pop up. You know, I, I I feel that there's a direct line from museum fine art installations to the pop ups of today, but that's you know that's an aesthetic uh, argument. Um, but yeah, so you drive through this thing, and and there were different spots decorated in different ways, um, like this particular one. How are they was, decorated? Well, this particular one, it was decorated in such a way you were supposed to make you feel happy. I think it was called something like the happiness pop-up or something like happy land or something <laughs> like that. And so all the all the spots were tried to make were made to look cheery. I mean, most of them were kind of abstract, okay, with like balloons and balls and colors and one spot I remember, there was like fake grass and fake folding chairs and like a mm. backdrop that made it look like you were at the beach. I think there was even sand. And there was a big sign somewhere that just said something like happiness or a day at the beach. And, you know, so you could you could take a sel you could sit in your car and take a selfie and it could look like you're at the beach or something. You know, it was like <laughs> it was that silly. But um, uh, but we've been to other. Po OK, let me tell you about one that was really interesting. This was called. Um, I th Maybe if I could find it online, I'll link to it. It was called, it was, uh, they tried to reenact from Alice in Wonderland, the Mad Hatter's Tea Party. Oh, wow. So my girlfriend found this one. And so there were a lot of actors, you know, there was a guy who was the Mad Hatter and there was, there was a couple of his assistants and, uh, they had, I think there were like 20 people there. It was actually in an alley outside of a nightclub in LA. <laughs> this is pre COVID. Um, there's a picture of me there. Uh, if they you had say so. They they had people put on uh, put on hats. They had hats people could wear. Okay, and um, crazy hats. And uh, you, you'd sit at the tea party. They served actual tea. You know, they served snacks. And um, uh, it was like a real tea party. But you know, they had some some degree of like entertainment. And they decorated the space. You know, to make it look crazy. You know, whatever. And um, oh, and it was alcoholic. You know, there was there was booze. You know, and. Uh, it was fun. It was fun. It was like it was like a it was it was a combination of like an installation performance and a tasting event. You know, it's interesting. You're reminding me of what they used to call them back in the '60s. They called them happenings. Happenings. Yeah. It's, well, can you describe a happening? Well, I can describe what I heard a happening was. I think the only happening I was at. I must have been three. <laughs> you were at one. No, if I was, I would have been three years old. I'm okay, saying. okay. I mean, it's like, you know, <laughs> maybe someone took a baby to a happening. My parents might have done it. But well, your, mom's, were, your mom was pretty That hip. was what we would call installation. That was the next version of the installation. If a an happening. installation is, well, a happening means that the difference between an installation and a happening is actually really cool. Uh, a happening, and you see this in flash mobs. You see there's variations of it today. Which is it? It's it's like an installation, but it ha it it puts together, and it's put together for a finite amount of time, and then it doesn't exist again. It's like the Zen wheel that they they would make perfectly, and then they whip it away again. And so, the point of a happening is that, in the word, is that you're here for this artistic moment, but it will only be in this moment, and then it's gone. So, like someone like Christo, who would do these installations where he would wrap you know, plastic around Central Park or something. That is really just an installation, but you know that that's a temporary installation. Whereas a happening is more like what you just described, like a Mad Hatter's Tea Party, with the idea behind it that you, that 
something will be created and then taken apart. I guess in a weird way, the modern version or the evolution of the happening is Burning Man. Yeah, yeah. Burning Man is kind of like the the great granddaddy of all the pop-ups almost, right? So, yeah. So once a year, Which they really all... really makes the happening old because the happening is the great granddaddy of the Burning Man. <laughs> right. And so once a year, they all gather at Burning Man and they take a bunch of pictures and you got to take pictures, you know, and then, uh, and then you come back to your normal world and you show people the pictures and you're like, yeah, I know. I work in an office, but uh, I'm still cool because look at this picture of me at Burning Man, you know. And, <laughs> um, well, I, and you're right. So the, the thing that makes that kind of artwork, and even in installations today, because no, there's, we're not, because certainly I have been to museums that have permanent installations, but I think a lot of what we're talking about right now are temporary installations. So part of the appeal is that you only have a limited amount of time to be part of this shared experience. And the people who are part of that shared experience, they, they're they in an elite group of people because just want, no yeah. one else has been there and no one else will ever be there again. Yeah, I mean, and plus, you know, there's the, with the pop-ups, there's the aspect of taking pictures, you know? I mean, I think that most of these pop-ups aren't vision as a place where people could take selfies and take pictures and put them on their Instagram, their social media. And I think they're doing fairly well, you know, a lot of these pop-ups and they're still going. I mean, I mean, COVID of course put like a little bit of a kibosh on them, but I think that um, they're starting to come back. You know, some big companies are doing like Netflix, they did uh, for Stranger Things, they did a pop-up. Oh, I've been to that one. That's- uh, You did, uh, you were? Glendale Galleria. Yeah, it's at the Glendale Galleria uh, or the Americana. Here in Los Angeles, we have a suburb called Glendale and we have a mall called the Americana, and there's a Stranger Things pop-up. So you went to it. Tell, tell us about it. I, I'm not a big, I'm not doing it any justice. To me, I feel like that was more of a promotional event where, you know, it's, there's a thing called experiential advertising, which uses a lot of the creative elements of a pop-up of an installation or happening, which is a pop-up event where they they create an experience based on whatever the branded product is and in this case the branded product is the tv show stranger things so besides having props replications things that are in the style it makes you feel like you're kind of walking into the world of stranger things just like uh in the on that very same mall two months ago when ted lasso came out they had a truck and the truck kept on was handing you the the, the little biscuits that Ted always gives people so that you, it was to promote Ted Lasso, but it was that experience of, look, I have the exact biscuit in a box so I can get that same experience of being in Ted Lasso land. This is it writ larger because unlike that, which is a simple marketing thing here, you're walking into an entire complex that's designed to create it. it you know, in fairness, that is what advertising does, right? And marketing does. It looks at what the fine artists are doing and it co-ops it for for merchandising. And, and and I'm not trying to be mean. And hell, if you're a big fan of Stranger Things, you would enjoy it. And on the converse up the street from me at the Skirball Center, they're doing something with that with Star Trek, where they have all the different props and stuff. And and you could argue it's no better or worse than the Star Trek exhibit. Well, isn't there like a uh, – they've recreated the Star Trek bridge somewhere. Isn't that in like yeah, Vegas or something? That's in Vegas. That's a whole other thing. But technically speaking – That's kind of like an installation. I mean, and if you think <laughs> about it, a haunted house, right, is is an installation. A fun house is an installation. Those yes. Halloween hay rides are installation. I mean, this the, – the it's a, such a fine line between theatricality and – well, and carnival and yeah. art. Well, the line is um, you're trying to make a space with an installation. I'm just going to use the, the the term installation as a blanket term. You're trying to make a space with an installation that is uh, – you feel like it's real or you you get a sense that it's real, right? I mean, it's, it's like a – Well, I think what separates the fine art installation from everything I've just mentioned is that there is – some kind of space 
that the artist has envisioned that they want you to experience that isn't in the service of just entertaining you or selling a product. It's some sort of mood or feeling or insight that the artist is trying to share with you. And they're using these living elements, these physical material elements, just like a, a two dimensional artist would, but they're bringing in all the senses so you can be in that space that they want you to be in. You know, now that you've broadened the, the uh, now that you've uh, opened the borders up, I'm thinking now of like uh, uh, murder mystery sh- uh, dinner yeah, shows. I mean, I'm thinking of yeah. anything, anything, I guess, where you're not looking at the painting, you're like inside of the painting. And, and that is where you get into this thing that's going on right now called the immersive experience. So, mm-hmm. right I think it's Van Gogh right now. It's the hottest ticket in town. None of us. Yeah, so museums, it's like going full circle. There's a Van Gogh show going around. I'll have to link to it. So yeah, they're you're try, they're they're literally trying to pull you into the Van Gogh paintings. Yeah. So you're inside the painting, and that is an interesting thing because it's like I went to a wall exhibition where they I got to wear a wall horror wig and and glasses. I so oh Warhol. Yeah, it's, I got to dress like Warhol in this installation of Warhol. So, like Van Gogh, Warhol's dead. Van Gogh is dead. Neither of them wanted to do installation. Well, actually, that's true. Warhol did a lot of installations, but the installation that I went to of his work was not his idea because it was someone in his estate who thought it would be cool. And obviously, Van Gogh has no control, nor the Van Gogh family. Maybe they do. But certainly, my point is that the artist wasn't trying to create an installation. An installation was created based on their work, which is either really cool or really mercenary, depending on your view, <laughs> right? Like, is, is this just a way of getting more money into the Van Gogh coffer? I or think it is. Or is <laughs> something that if Vincent Van Gogh had been alive, would go, oh, this is awesome. I'm so glad that people get to have this experience. Well, you know, it's interesting. People really love these things, you know. I mean, because it's it's fun, you know. I I, I, I enjoy all these things. I mean, you go there, you you're surrounded by the peace, you know. I mean, even just a simple something as simple as a haunted house. I mean, I used to love those as a kid. Um, it's it's fun, right? I mean, I mean, I guess the cynic in me, it's like these people who are spending so much time and money to go in the immersive Van Gogh experience, would they actually just go? to a museum and just look at Van Gogh paintings? Would they have the patience to just sit there and just watch Van Gogh's work and just sit down? I mean, (laughs) okay, I apologize for being the snarky Gen X boy in the room, but there is a part of me that makes me think, look, okay, like, would you spend that same amount of money and buy a new artwork or would you spend that same amount of money and go and just sit in front of a Van Gogh for about, it literally, what you figure, the, the immersive Van Gogh experience is probably, what, 45 minutes. Would you take that same 45 minutes and just go and look at the various work? Would you spend 45 minutes just sitting there staring at a single work? I mean, folks, if you really love <laughs> fine art, I'm going to be an a-hole on this. I apologize. Don't do that. Go and look at real Van Gogh. Go to a real exhibition. If there's no exhibition, there's just one Van Gogh painting, sit your butt down for 20 minutes and look at that painting. Then get up and walk around and make your own immersive experience. Don't let other people mediate your your experience with Van Gogh. I'm sorry. I apologize. And God knows my girlfriend really wants to go. So it means I really want to go. Uh, but I had to get that out of my chest. Wow. You're such a purist, Chris. Um what do you what do you say about what do you say about a person that they're vaguely familiar with Van Gogh and his work? They know maybe he cut off his ear, maybe they don't even know that, and they don't really have much interest in going to a museum. But they hear about the Van Gogh exhibit and they say, "Oh, that sounds kind of cool," and then they they go. How, how oh, do you like feel about that? Baby's first person? art show. Yeah, like Baby's first art oh, show. How do you feel? Yeah, by all means, go. Good job, baby. Good job. Baby. <laughs> Very good. Now you know what a painting looks like. Nice. Now that you've made the first step, why don't you go into a real museum? And then when you're done with the real museum, why don't you go into a gallery and look into contemporary art, okay? Something that hasn't been told to you is great. Something you get to experience. I, I, whoa, (laughs) I don't know why I'm getting so mad. 
You sound a little snobby here. I am so ranty on this, but I got to admit, I have always hated people who go to these kinds of events because I would argue they're they they just want to they want bragging rights, and what they're doing is they're making it more expensive for me to go to go to the museum because museums now know instead of actually getting you know 15 to 30 paintings by an artist and putting it in a room and then just charging me a reasonable sum of money they're now just going to do a video show charge me an insane amount of money <laughs> and i'll just be mad it's like cats for broadway or hamilton it's like this isn't good this is just popular well, I'm we, sorry. I don't know where this anger is coming. But. I know. That's a lie. Well, we do live in L.A. You can go to uh, contemporary galleries and f- look at new art for free most of the time. Um, and yes, we'll even give really you can. wine and cheese for free. It's amazing. Yeah, it's a good deal, folks. Support real artists. Living <laughs> artists need your money. Van Gogh does not need your money. He died a while ago. Spoiler alert. He might you know, have needed your money while he was alive, but you can't do much about it now. All right, that reminds me of a story. I'll just tell briefly. Uh, I think I was in like a Las Vegas. So there's a casino in Vegas that has a bunch of Van Goghs. I forget which yeah. it was, the Win or something. But anyway, um, so they were they went all out on like their Van Gogh stuff, and they I went to the souvenir shop, the gift shop, and and they had like mugs with uh, Van Goghs on them. And I remember <laughs> I remember thinking how how silly it looked, and I picked up a mug, and yeah. I said, "What's this?" Right. And I knew it was a Van Gogh on the mug. Right. And then I was talking to my girlfriend and then the uh, the woman running the uh, gift shop. I didn't know she was there. She's standing a little bit to my left. And she said she said very haughtily snobby. She said, oh, that's Van Gogh. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, OK, all right. I didn't... <laughs> you didn't say that's Van Gogh. <laughs> yeah, she didn't pronounce it right either. But uh, it's funny because uh it's like yeah, uh, I don't know. It was just I knew it was Van Gogh, but it was like it was like um, it was like she was just so. I mean, she was very snobby about Van Gogh being on a mug. I mean, which is well, ridiculous, I right? I mean, why would you put? Term, why would you do it? Yeah, you're right. I mean, it was silly because it wasn't even the whole painting. It was like cropped piece of the painting yeah. on the mug, and it was wrapped yeah. around the mug. It was terrible, right? It was terrible, Chris. Yeah. Again, growing up in your city, I know exactly what you're talking about. I always go to museum gift shops. But <laughs> that said, I, I about three years ago, very briefly, had a Samsung phone, which allowed me to use an Oculus, which gave me a chance to experience VR. And I do honestly think, and not to contradict everything I've just said, but I do like the idea of creating installation art or even immersive art for VR. I think in that place, and we have a friend, right, who does that, who, you know, and I feel like that is a great thing. I really look forward to more artwork where it is an immersive environment, or it could even be a Van Gogh. I don't really care. That's fine with me to walk through the world of Van Gogh while you've got VR goggles on, or to experience an installation with VR goggles, because at least it democratizes it so that you don't have to go to New York or Los Angeles. You don't have to spend 50 bucks or wait online or be around other people. You just put these goggles on and maybe even headphones on and you just, wherever you are, you're going to walk through that world. I love that. Well, I'll just say I'm, I think it's very interesting and exciting that the installation, which I always loved in museums has like broken out into the wider world. Thanks to social media, you know, and COVID and, and COVID <laughs> and people wanting to take pictures and put them on their I mean, social media and, and and people are going to these things and enjoying them and I look at them well I look at them like they're traditional art installations and and they're they're giving a lot of artistic minded people work because artists you know real artists have to have to craft these spaces you know and I see the work put into these spaces it's a lot of work Chris No and, I don't disagree with you I mean I'm I'm being a little overly cynical and I remember at LACMA about 10 years ago, they put a permanent installation outside of LACMA of what, those are lamps, street lamps? Yeah, the street lamps, yeah, LA street lamps, yeah. And it's just like a hundred LA street lamps in a very beautiful design. And to this day, I see people taking wedding photos there. It's probably one of the most photographed spaces that is in Disneyland in <laughs> Los Angeles. And it's it, And in that sense, 
you could argue the beauty of public installations that you don't have to pay for, they're just out in the world that you can photograph yourself with, then you are creating your own art because you're taking what the artist made and you're taking yourself and you're combining the two and, and you're, you're co-authoring your own thing. And that, yeah, maybe that is beautiful. I think the best thing I can say about, uh, about installations is, especially not so much the commercial stuff, is it does force you to look at life and the world and the materials of the world in a completely different way. So none of us would stop to look at a street lamp, maybe a few of us would, but when you take a hundred street lamps and you put them in an interesting configuration, now everyone is gonna stop and look at the exact same thing they might have ignored and see the beauty that was always there. And that, and in that sense, that's what an installation can do right in my opinion. Well, I like all these installations. Uh, I guess I just uh, uh, just want to say that I like them, and I think it's great that people like them, that they're exploded into the mainstream, so to speak, and I hope to see more of them. And, yeah, what do you think, Chris? Well, you know, I haven't been to these fancy-schmancy Van Gogh, Matisse, whatever walk in the world with <laughs> Picasso, and it's because, A, I don't have a lot of money, and, B, they're sold out. But obviously, if I had money and I had a ticket and I went, I would probably be on your side of things. Hey, folks, you really should try this thing out. It's wonderful and it's good. Uh, and, and by the way, everyone should do this because then you'll get to appreciate the artist in a whole new light. Every so often, I will do puzzles based on famous works of art in the hope that it will get me to, to appreciate the experience of brushwork. So who am I to say that this is not the best way to get into Van Gogh? Uh, I'm a real cynical bastard, but this I, do, I do like the awesome. the idea too of people taking photos at these events, these installations, and making like what you could call new I art. Taking photos of yourself at the installation is actually the I love it because it is you're making your own art, folks. If you right. are going to go to these installations, take photos because your photos are co-opting the intent of the original artist <laughs> so that you can put your own imprinter on it. And that's the whole point, in my opinion, uh, of you finding a way of interacting with the work. And I think that's the beauty of installation art in general, is that it, that it wants your physical presence to, to be part of the narrative. The art does not really, art in general, even painting and sculpture, if there's no one to observe it, it's like the tree that falls into the forest. It doesn't. It may fall, it may make a sound, but if no one is there to listen, then what is the point? That's nature, but in art, if there's no one there to really experience or react, then the art is, 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 not, is lifeless and dead. So if this is the way that you can see things in a new way or appreciate things in a new light, then, oh, this is a great thing. Yeah, I, honestly, you know, that's all I can really say that's positive. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, you know, I, I think- On a high point. I think you you're right. I mean, I see people at these installations and they're they're all enjoying themselves. I mean, people love these things, you know, and they're taking pictures and I see, you know, people are enjoying them themselves at these pop-ups, installations, whatever you call them, more than like at a traditional museum. And I think that's great. Yeah, and I look, if that's what gets museums to make money and if that's what gets people drawn into art, if if that's like I said, if that's baby's first art show, <laughs> I love it. If that's all you ever do, then you're a philistine. Please stop listening. To me. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna call it a day because clearly I'm, I'm this is a trigger. So uh, I'm Chris. <laughs> I'm Randall. Bye. We'll talk less triggering stuff later. Bye. <laughs>